Hello everyone at uh, Springfield Gospel Hall in our Arbroath. Uh, it's lovely to have this opportunity to open God's Word with you, even virtually. And uh, it's just a shame that we can't be together. I've always loved uh, coming up um, to speak at our Arbroath. And I wish I could be with you uh, physically now. Uh, but let's turn to God's Word together uh, during these difficult days. I hope that you're keeping safe and well, uh, wherever you're listening or watching from. And uh, it does us good, doesn't it, to open God's word and to uh, look into what it has to say to us about our saviour, about ourselves and about the world around us. I'd like to ask you to turn uh, today to the letter of 1 Corinthians, to Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, please. And I want us to look at chapter 1, 1 Corinthians and chapter 1, not the whole chapter, just a portion of it. This letter is, of course, a fundamental letter for our understanding of of the church. There is so much that we would not know from the word of God if we didn't have 1 Corinthians. And it is just vital, fundamental to our understanding of assembly life, of what it means to gather uh, to the name of the Lord Jesus, what it means to worship together, how we ought to gather. Uh, This letter is just so important. But you know, it's really vital how you start a letter, how you begin a letter. I'm sure that all of you are aware of that if you've ever even uh, sent off an email. How you begin that email is so important, isn't it? I remember when I joined uh, the Royal Household, it took a while just to get used to how things are done there in really what is quite a formal uh, environment. And it's not acceptable just to fire off an email saying, hi there, uh, you know, and and sign off uh, just with your name. You know, there's all sorts of uh, formal ways that you've got to begin and end these things. And the beginning and endings of the epistles in the New Testament are so important for our understanding of them. You know, one of the uh, principal themes of 1 Corinthians is the theme of unity, the unity of all of the Lord's people. And it's a a wonderful theme to spend time thinking about. It's such a precious truth and it gets right to the heart of what it means for us to be saved, to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ is this truth of unity. Not only unity with Christ, but unity amongst ourselves as the people of God. And it will go on to be identified by Paul as a real problem. A real problem in the Corinthian assembly, problems of division, problems of alienation one from the other. And, you know, I think this is really important in the days in which we're living because Satan will do his utmost to divide assemblies during this time, won't he? Because not only are we physically separated one from the other, so we're not enjoying the warmth and closeness of fellowship that we would normally long for. And I'm sure that there are many of you who are just really missing that. I've really struggled uh, over the past few months just with wanting to be with my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus, wanting to gather on a Lord's Day morning. It's tough, isn't it? Week after week uh, to not be seeing each other as we were used to be seeing each other. I know that some assemblies are able to get back for some meetings. Um, We're not at that stage yet at Ladybank Gospel Hall. And before I continue, can I bring you greetings from the Lord's people at Ladybank Gospel Hall, where Rebecca and I are now in fellowship. It's lovely to be with the Lord's people, but it's sad when we can't be. You know, that theme is brought out very forcibly in these opening verses of 1 Corinthians because Paul understands under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that it's very important how you start a letter. And so he starts with these themes. It's so important for us to come back time and again to who we are in Christ, to who you and I as born again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who we are in Christ Jesus. I hope that whoever you are listening, that you are a born again Christian, that you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for your own personal salvation. If you've never done that, then today is the day to do that. Today is the day to recognise that you are a sinner, that you are in need of salvation, of somebody to save you, and that the only saviour for all sinners for all time is Jesus Christ. Through his death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, Jesus Christ is the saviour and he will save anyone who comes to him in repentance and in faith, trusting in him and his work upon the cross and his glorious resurrection, you can be saved. For those of us who are Christians and who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our saviour, I want us to spend a bit of time today thinking about who we are in Christ I want us to read the first nine verses, only the first nine verses of this chapter. And we're going to think about these uh, together. So let's read these first nine verses. Paul, 
called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called, into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And God will add his own blessing to the reading of his word. I'd like to just direct your attention back to verse 1, chapter 1 and verse 1. And Paul here identifies himself. We're principally going to be looking at Paul's identification of us as the recipients, if you like, of this letter as believers. But in the first verse, Paul knows it's important under the Spirit's inspiration, to establish his authority. And he identifies himself like this. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. So there's a few things there, really. He's called. There is a calling placed upon his life. And that has been through the means of the will of God. This is a a calling that has been placed on him by God himself to be something, to be something, to be an apostle, a sent one. And not only a sent one, but a sent one of Christ Jesus. So he's Paul, he's called, he's called by the will of God, he's called to be an apostle, and it's all in Christ Jesus. Well, he's established here his authority. There are five uses of the word called or calling in chapter one, and they're all important. Let's just look at them briefly together. So that's the first one, the first of the five, called by the will of God to be an apostle. And there we're thinking about authority. Then look on to verse 2. Called to be saints. Called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Called to be saints together. We're going to spend a moment or two thinking about that uh, just uh, as we unfold our study today. Called to be saints together. So this time not authority but sanctity. Sanctity. Called to be saints in the present. And then down to verse 9, down to verse 9, by whom you were called, that's a past action, you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Something that cannot be undone, a past reality. So this time, not authority or sanctity, but security. Security in the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And then uh, on beyond our passage for today to verse 24, Verse 24. And here uh, the apostle is talking about how the gospel is a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But then as far as we are concerned, verse 24 applies. But to those who are called, and that's us, brothers and sisters, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. If we had not been born again, brothers and sisters, the gospel would be a stumbling block and folly to us as well. And perhaps one day it was. Perhaps you can remember a time when you just simply didn't understand the gospel and the light of it just hadn't dawned on your soul at all. And yet now we have been called and so we are those for whom and to whom Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So we have been called into clarity, into clarity. Paul's authority, our sanctity, our security and this wonderful clarity that the Lord has brought us into. But just lastly, down to verse 26, it says this, For consider your calling brothers not many of you were wise according to worldly standards not many were powerful not many were of noble birth and so on and so forth but god verse 27 chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise and so on so here we have our identity our identity to consider our calling brothers what was it we were called from what was it we have been called out of and what sort of people are we that god has called You know, as we think about who we are in Christ this morning, it's good for us to think about who we are in the world's eyes. And we're so different one from the other. 
If we were to be in the same room, and I wish we could be, then you could look around the assembly at Arbroath and see people from vastly different backgrounds, people with different family circumstances, people with different interests outside of Christian things, people who really may have very little in common if it weren't for our wonderful Saviour, the Lord Jesus. We may never meet, we may never have had anything to do with one another if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus. And so with that in mind, then we think about three things, three things that I want to draw out uh, from these nine verses of 1 Corinthians 1 about who we are in Christ. And I want to think about it in terms of the past and the present and the future. First of all, I want to think about the past and I want to think about our condition. And I want to think about the present and our calling. And I want to think about the future and our confidence. And firstly, we find that in the past, our condition is fixed, that we are sanctified. And then our calling in the present is to be saints. And then our confidence in the future is that we are sustained. We are sustained. So let's go back to verse 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be sanctified, brothers and sisters? Well, I'd like us to turn to the book of Hebrews, please to the book of Hebrews and to chapter 10. And here I would like us to see two important aspects of sanctification. What does it mean to be sanctified? To be sanctified means to be set apart, to be consecrated, to be made holy. To be made holy. You can cast your mind back to the tabernacle and to the temple uh, where things had to be consecrated. Both individuals like the priests, the Levitical priests, had to be consecrated, set apart, made holy, and the utensils. In fact, everything in the tabernacle and the temple had to be sanctified and set apart by the sprinkling of blood that it might be possible for God to make use of these things uh, and remain holy and for uh, worship to be orchestrated towards God in a way that was pleasing to him. Let's read uh, Hebrews 10 and uh, verse 5. Hebrews 10 and verse 5. Consequently, when Christ came into the world... He said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. So our minds are cast back to uh, the temple and the tabernacle, sacrifices and offerings. But in this instance, a body, a human body, had been prepared for the Lord Jesus. Verse 6 In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Now we're back to the will of God. That's what we read about in verse one, isn't it? The will of God is that will which took Saul of Tarsus and turned him into an apostle of Christ Jesus. But in verse 10 of Hebrews 10, we read about this will in another aspect of what it has brought about. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We have been sanctified, a past reality, a fixed event. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So friends, the first thing to establish is this, that your sanctification and mine is fixed and unchanging. Just in the same way that the priests were consecrated and made Uh, suitable for priestly service and from then on they were priests they were holy priests they could serve in the tabernacle and the temple and although they had to make offerings for their own sin they didn't have to be reconsecrated as priests it was a once uh, for all transaction it was a one time transaction well here we have that same aspect of sanctification that you and I at our new birth were set apart for holy service made holy made righteous But if we carry on reading in Hebrews 10, we find another aspect of it. Verse 14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Those who are being sanctified. So here we have that other aspect of it, that we are being changed, aren't we? From glory into glory, made more like our saviour day by day. And we are being sanctified. It's continuous. It's continual. It's It's a daily work. As God works in our lives to make us more like our saviour, to take away those rough edges of sin in our conduct and in our character and to change us into his likeness. 
So we have been set apart, we have been sanctified, we have been consecrated, and yet, and yet, as set apart vessels, as consecrated priests, our character is also being formed day by day into the likeness of our Saviour. Well, that's the first thing. That's in the past. We have been sanctified. But what about the present? What about the present? Well, it just comes uh, after this in the phrase of verse 2. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus, and now presently called to be saints. Called to be saints. So important for us to understand what it means for us to be saints. And I'm sure that none of us are uh, under the the wrong impression that often is... um, pervades throughout Christendom of what saints are, that they are special individuals who've been identified uh, by the Roman Catholic Church or other church systems and elevated to a saint status. Of course, that's not true at all. Every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ upon the new birth is automatically a saint. And that's absolutely linked to what we were saying about sanctification. We've been set apart, we've been made holy, and so we are saints. What does it mean for us to be saints in practice? Well, there's just three things I want to draw out from the word of God about what it means for us to be saints. The first is found in Ephesians 2. You don't need to turn there. I'll be turning to one or two scriptures just at this point. Ephesians and chapter 2. And let me read verses 18 and 19. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then... You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So the first thing we want to establish is this, that sainthood is God-given. Sainthood is God-given. It can't be conferred by man, of course, or by a church system. It's God-given. We wouldn't have it were it not for him. And it means membership of the household of God. Here we are, fellow citizens, saints, members of the household of God. The second thing is found in Jude chapter 1 and elsewhere, but it's illustrated well in Jude chapter 1 and verse 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Once for all delivered to the saints. So not only is our sainthood God-given, but it also entails a guardianship. A guardianship that you and I, as saints, sanctified ones, we are entrusted, entrusted with a body of truth. And of course it's found in the word of God and it's found in the gospel. And these things are uh, the privilege that we have of this body of truth, this gospel, this doctrine that we believe. And it's common to all Christians. Now, of course, uh, Christians vary, don't they? Uh, Professing believers, born again believers, uh, vary in their understanding of some of the smaller things uh, that we find in the Bible, some of the uh, less important issues and some of the important issues too. But there is a core body of Christian confession that is held true by every born again believer. And it's very, very precious. And then lastly, Colossians 1. Colossians 1 and verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So this time not thinking about our God-given sainthood or the guardianship that we've been entrusted with, but glory. But glory in the future. The inheritance of the saints in light. There's something in our future, friends, that we all share as believers in the Lord Jesus. Sadly, Uh, In the day and age in which we live, and indeed since Pentecost really until today, the church has been riven by division, by uh, a lack of unity. Uh, Goodness knows how many denominations of Christendom there are, but it will run into the thousands. Uh, So many ways in which we have split and, and divided. And it's very sad and it must sadden the heart of God to see it. But here we find it expressed in clarity, this doctrine of unity to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints alone? No, called to be saints together. Together with who? Together with all those, all those who in every place do what? Call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's both their Lord and ours. That's a wonderful, mysterious union. You know, 
I mentioned this in my uh, little devotional video this week, but, you know, if there's a, a believer in a Chinese prison today, and you and I have never met him, we've never heard of him, and he's never met or heard of us, we are completely united with him. As he cries out to God in his prison cell, we are completely united with him. It's his Lord. It's our Lord. It's the same Savior, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been experts, haven't we, as believers, in dividing one from the other. And yet here we have it expressed so, so beautifully, all those who in every place. Well, let's go on now to think about um, this inheritance of the saints in light, this future aspect uh, that's brought out here in 1 Corinthians 1. And let's just read again um, verse 6 onwards. Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're waiting for, brothers and sisters. We're not waiting for an end to the pandemic. We're not waiting for a, a utopia to be established in this world. We're not waiting for our political party to win the day. We're not waiting for the Antichrist. We're not waiting for world destruction. We are waiting for the Saviour to be revealed from heaven. We are waiting for the Lord Jesus to come to take us, to be with himself where he is in the Father's house. That's our blessed hope. That's our blessed hope. The world sets its hopes on all sorts of things. Our hope is in the return of Jesus Christ for his own, what we call the rapture of the church. But what about the time that lies between now and then? You don't know and I don't know when that day is going to be, that the Lord is going to come to take us to be with himself. I'm sure that events around us in the world today are making us more mindful uh, hopefully, more mindful of the re the soon return of Christ, the imminency of it. But when it will be, we don't know. But until then, we read in verse 8, who will sustain you, who will sustain you to the end. And then in these last few verses, I think we have everything that we've thought about so far tied up, tied up beautifully like the threads of a tapestry. He, he, who, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless, Guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctified. Guiltless. Holy. Sanctified. God is faithful. By whom you were called. Here we are back to our calling. Into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Do you ever feel that you can't sustain the Christian life? Do you ever feel that it's beyond you? Conscious of your weakness, of your um, lack of spiritual zeal sometimes. We all are. And yet we read in verse 8 that it's Christ Jesus, the one who will be revealed, who will sustain us until the day of his revealing. He will sustain us, not your strength, not mine, not your Bible reading or prayer or effort, not my Bible reading or prayer or effort, but the sustenance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you always faithful? Am I always faithful? Certainly not. We're often faithless. But in verse 9... We're reassured with this, God is faithful. So it's the Lord who sustains us. It's God who is faithful by whom you were called. It's him who called you. It's him who sustains you. It's him who will take you to glory. Let me just finish, brothers and sisters, by uh, reading from 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And let me read from verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. No more coronavirus. No more mask wearing. No more social distancing. In fact, we will be with the Saviour. Not only with each other, but there with the Saviour, with no sin to spoil the picture. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? So many people worldwide are feeling the sting of death. Death approaching in their own life and bereavement of those who are loved around them. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. And then here we have a wonderful verse that all of us I'm sure can echo. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, what a wonderful thing to consider our condition that we are sanctified. It's a past reality.
to think about the present that we are called and we're called to be saints and to cast our eyes to the future, to our confidence. And we can have confidence because we are sustained. Sustained by the same one that went to Calvary for us. Sustained by the same one who will be revealed. God is faithful. Every blessing to you. And I can't wait until uh, we can be together again. Amen.